you've got a, a negative impact in some way environmentally. Two, two points. Um, first of all, historically, socialism has been far worse, worse polluter than in capitalist How so? countries. <laughs> well, just look at the environmental destruction that the Soviet Union left. It. it was a complete disaster. Right, but that's this, this is socialism done wrong, John. We're going to do it right. <laughs> also, what are you referencing? <laughs> <laughs> like, what is it oil extraction no the u.s the u.s like topples that the u.s <laughs> destroys the ussr in co2 emissions is it oh is it the nuclear fallout is that it okay all right well he saw he saw the hbo show and then he was like well yeah no that, that conclusively proves my point I, I, i'm sure everyone knows this capitalism and marxism and socialism this uh, right now we're in a wave of this right it's become right. more popular now uh, I, I would say over the last particularly during the Trump administration so the, mm -hmm. the concept of socialism at least has become more more publicly discussed than uh, any time that I can remember in my life mm -hmm. why do you think that is I think it's because the generation that's coming up is I mean you have to understand the academic community is is I always say the intellectuals have always been the enemy of business uh enemy of certainly the in, 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 enemy of capitalism and but why is that i think because in a in a market society uh <clears throat> which has been rare in history we haven't mostly had market societies but they're not very important in a market society uh the think, intellectuals aren't very important generally not as important no but aren't they the ones that inspire the minds of the people that create and and maybe innovate in the industry they don't have the same social status that the entrepreneurs have uh oh. an elon musk or uh, steve jobs whoa. Or whoa wow i did not think this was going to go down this road so they're just of uh, a higher class a better stock if you will they're uh, just just finer finer human beings across the board Interesting. Jeff Bezos. These so you guys. think it's an ego issue? The social status issue? Th think about it this way. If you, you're, you're going to school, okay, and the people that end up teaching in the universities were always the smartest kids in the school generally. Wrong. And they, and they did well in school. I mean smart Wrong. in terms of doing well in school. And they go on to college and then they, they, they go and get a PhD and then they, they – that's all they've known is school. That's, that's been their universe, right? right? And they excelled at it. Okay, first off, someone who's gone for a doctorate or even a double doctorate in a very highly specialized field is going to know an, an inordinate amount of information on that field. If you were to ask them about other things – and this is a problem when you get people like Dr. Jordan Peterson and you start to talk to these individuals about things outside of their realm of expertise, that's where you get the pseudo-history, the pseudoscience, the nonsense. And in this case, I believe this person's a climate change denier. On top of that, who knew? But yes, they're very, very good at this one thing. Ben Carson, Ben Carson is a neurosurgeon. He's a neurosurgeon. Have you heard him talk about grain and how Jesus of Nazareth stored grain in the pyramids and stuff? And you're like, what the hell? What are these words coming out of your mouth, sir? But you're a neuroscientist. You, you like, uh, sorry, a neurosurgeon. You know an infinite more um, uh, amount uh, on on that subject than I ever will. Like, it's not even it's not even comparable. But at the same time, that doesn't make you a better human being. You're not a better stock. By the way, here's a spoiler warning. People who get these degrees, these university degrees, are usually people of privilege. And you come from a family, and if you do well in school, guess what? Yeah, it might be because your parents had enough time to constantly indoctrinate you, to constantly tutor you, to constantly help you, and say you should focus on this. And B, had enough money to be able to afford to get you into other institutions, even private school, if that's the case, to get tutors for you, all that kind of stuff. And then, can you get into a university? Well... If you do have very, very good grades, that's one thing. That's one thing. That's that's one way to get into these schools. The other thing is if you have friends in high places. If you happen to have someone who knows the dean, if you happen to have someone who's like, oh, if you come from a famous family, stuff like that. It's not necessarily just because schools are this perfect meritocratic system in which only the smart survive and ascend to the throne. And that's why we have to respect them as just better human beings. They're better stock. And they were smarter than the other kids in school. And now these other kids, they, they go to college and they get a degree in business and they're in a fraternity and, and they make a lot of friends and relationships and they, and they make more money than the intellectuals do. And it, that seems like that's completely unfair. It's an unjust world that the less smart people are making more money than the smart people do and they have more status in the society. And I think, I think that's under, under, underlying it is a resentment or an envy of a society that doesn't mm. judge them to be as important as they judge themselves. That's interesting. 
I mean, sounds like uh, good old-fashioned eugenics. I mean, are we going to talk about the bell curve pretty soon and IQs? I don't know if you knew this, but you can actually divide IQ rates on racial lines. You can you can cut you can cut them like a knife. I'm curious, but I think it's a very flawed perspective. And first of all, the the term smart is a weird term. I right? said smart in terms of school. Mm -hmm. I didn't say in terms of street smarts yeah. or ability to do things, to connect with people. Uh, there's emotional intelligence. I'm merely saying they're good at taking tests, writing papers. Uh, abstracting thoughts, essentially. Uh, yeah, but this is what I'm saying. That, just the term smart, it's almost like, oh, what I promise it's like a Good blanket term, right? It's like drugs. You know, like it applies to a bunch of different things that don't necessarily seem to be related. But the people that are interested in that pursue that. The fact that they can't understand that there's an intent, like, Elon Musk is a great example. If you don't think Elon Musk is intelligent, you're either do not you're in you're not very intelligent yourself. Yeah. You don't think Elon Musk is intelligent. You're delusional, <laughs> or you're a liar, or you're in denial. Right. It's it's one of those things. Is something wrong with the way you think? He's clearly intelligent. Definitely not but transphobic. There's people that call him a fool, and that like the guy's running like four different businesses simultaneously. They're all successful. And he's innovating with when it comes to space travel in a way that you would assume that someone have to dedicate most of their life just singularly to that task to be able to figure out past NASA how to shoot a rocket up into space and have it land right. and then reuse it. No one's been able to do that besides him or up until he did it. And I think he, uh, Jeff Bezos. Is he invented science. It's pretty wild. He actually he he, he came forward and then he was like, you all want science? And then came the star child. I mean, he's powered by mines and diamonds and rubies and all the magical things in the universe. They're obviously two of the great entrepreneurs of yeah. this particular era. But I don't think Jeff Bezos is actually engineering these things. But if you think about it, the, the intellectuals have always disliked business. They've always discriminated against the merchant classes, the Jews in the West, Chinese in the East. There's really been no historical period where intellectuals praised business, maybe a little bit around the time of Adam Smith up until probably Ricardo and Malthus wrote in the early 19th century. It's, it's, for the most part, business people have been seen, they're disruptive, they change things, they upset the status quo, they're, they, in, they innovate. Well, a lot of people don't like innovations. It's threatening. It changes, uh, it changes social status, it changes wealth relationships. Uh, the, it's almost like uh, capitalism is like a genie that got out of the bottle. And they're trying very hard to stuff the genie back in the bottle as much as they can. And I think if you think about it that way, you'll understand we're never going to win the intellect. Well, I guess Caleb Mopin was right about one person when he was talking about Malthusianism. Because I guess the CEO of Whole Foods just wants the master race to keep ascending. It's kind of kind of the vibe I'm getting right now. I mean, I speak in universities all the time. And the students, I'm an entrepreneur, I self-identify that way. Students love when I talk about conscious capitalism. Because I say, you can do good and you can do well. There's no contradiction here. You're not, you're the good guys here. You're not the bad guys. Do you debate guys. people about this? Have I do. I deb have... I've debated a number of socialists. And what, what, what is their primary argument? Their primary argument is, is that business is greedy and selfish. <laughs> it's about motivation. <laughs> that, that, they, that business people have the wrong motivation. I would love to know who these socialists are. Who, who did you speak to? <laughs> Where they were like, yeah, well, I can, I can define socialism for you. It's that, uh, it's that business is greedy. That's, that's socialism. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, Marx originally defined it a little bit different, but then Engels came along, fixed that. And then so now we got, we got that definition. It's great. And then every other person who's interpreted this throughout history has kind of either got it wrong or they're kind of a little bit off base, even if it's different, you know, scholars or people who came up with this independent of even Marxian thought, you know? In a lot of ways, conscious capitalism is an answer to that. It's a complete answer to that because in the book and in conscious leadership as well, we're basically arguing that business isn't primarily about maximizing profits business is primarily about creating value for other people and <laughs> through creating value oh, for other people oh, you do make a profit how but lovely it's the value creation that comes first the profits come second mm. in exchange right and it's almost if you are creating value then you are profitable 
and then you can reinvest those profits and you and you have this upwards spot. Wow, yeah, he definitely understands labor theory of value. So here's how it works, my friend. Say you want to sell people food, wholesome foods, whole foods, if you will. So you want to sell you want to sell this pickle. So you, you want to sell the pickle, and then you need to have an employee to sell that pickle for you. So what you're going to do is the, the person's gonna grow the pickle. And then you're going to sell the pickle in order for you to make money off that sale of the pickle you have to sell that pickle for more money than the person who grow it the amount of money you're paying them so you're going to extract value from their labor there's going to be surplus value in that case in which case at the end of the day the person who's grown the pickle gets less money than you but that's the only way that you're going to make a profit so that's that's how the whole system works and then every other person who wants to compete against you has to do the same thing because you're all in competition with each other in the current system as it is so then there's the other pickle salesman who will then pay their pickle producers less money and then they make more money than you and then you see that and you're like well fuck me i gotta sell my pickles for less i gotta pay my pickle people less money so you pay your pickle people way less money and then you, you're at competition levels but then he realizes he can just outsource and then he can buy cheaper pickles over in china so he's outsources to China and then all of a sudden he's got all these Chinese pickles they're way cheaper than yours and he makes more money than you so you're like well fuck I'm gonna outsource to China too but then he realizes even better is he can have robot pickle producers so he gets the robot pickle producers to produce all his pickles he doesn't have to pay them anything it's amazing and then he makes more money than everyone and that's that that that's a cat that's a capitalism that's 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 the pickle monopoly so that's that business has this potential for higher purpose it's not primarily about greed greed is found in human nature, Joe, it's not just found in business people. There are plenty of greedy governmental officials, plenty of greedy politicians, oh. greedy lawyers. Oh. Greed is endemic to the human nature. Business people either have no more or no less than it. It's just part of who we are. Has anyone ever laid it out in a way that's very compelling? Like when you have these debates with socialists and someone, has anyone ever laid it out in a way? Say where his name. I want to hear you say point, Richard you see their point? You always... The best way to do a debate is to completely understand the other side's position. Yeah. I <laughs> yeah you have no idea what understand. socialism is. And so <laughs> I've read widely in socialistic literature. I think oh, I do understand it. Please, name it's, me. It's, it's a type of utopianism. It's, a, it's an attempt to it's, change oh, human nature. No, it's not. It's not. Holy shit. In all three volumes of Das Kapital, they do not talk about the utopian dream. It's not about, hey, here's how society should be. In fact, that's some have said to the detriment of both of them. The only time you'll find writing of that nature is in Critique of the Gotha program, where they talk a little bit about the, uh, the way in which the whole society could move forward. But there's no utopianism. It's not like this will achieve this magnificent dream. The whole thing is a reflection on economics it's it's a that's why they call it economic theory it's and it's something that you would find independent independent this is a priori knowledge it's stuff that is just going to be like one plus one equals two the way we figured out mathematics works the way that we've uh, observed that gravity works like they didn't invent this Not, none of this was created by them they didn't invent these they discovered it there's a huge difference you discover how this stuff works then you're like well okay now we understand that Someone else would discover it. If, if everything got destroyed and burned down and all society was gone in a couple more years, and if we rebuilt and someone started exploiting someone else's labor, it would be very easy to discover. That's why, by the way, so many black scholars have discovered this independent of Marx and, and they do not get enough credit for it. it. It's happened multiple times throughout history, especially in, in countries in which, yes, labor is being exploited. Like, who knew? If someone is exploiting your labor in the form of slavery, then you might figure out, well, yeah, there's something about this. They're, they're kind of exploiting me for surplus value if we would all be if we would all love each other and if we'd all share equally uh then the world would be a better place and mm -hmm. hey guess what it probably would be if if we were naturally that way but we're not naturally that way we we look first generally for ourselves and our own families and then our and our growing circle of relationships that we develop we want we don't it's not natural to it's natural to want your own children to have advantages. That's that's just human nature to want your children to flourish because you you raise them, you love them, and somehow or another to say that's unfair is cutting against human nature. People are always going to look for for advantages or privileges, so to speak, for their children. Yeah, people don't like when people have advantages and have and and have victories because then someone has. Yeah, to he's lose. doing the whole. When someone is loses, good. they equate that someone losing with a bad feeling with that, that person being victimized like there's some all right so here's a big idea we talk about in conscious leadership we have a chapter
One book I would recommend he reads, this one's a little old, it might be a little bit dry, but uh, Mutual Aid, A Factor in Evolution by Peter Kropotkin. Uh, it's kind of like the antithesis of the whole lobster theory with Jordan Peterson, because Jordan Peterson likes to talk about how there's a natural hierarchy in order and observe the lobsters and you too can be one of these amazing dominant lobster species. You learn out actually through uh, most different species, uh, cooperation is actually usually prized and it's it's done throughout a whole bunch of different mammals, including our ancestors, the, the ancestors we shared, they, they work in cooperation with each other other and that of course makes them more powerful uh, it makes them more powerful than their independent counterparts or people who are other animals or species that would try to do the same thing without uh, working together or banding together so it's uh it's 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 a much better reflection on society than thinking that we're all greedy capitalist monster machines who just want to exploit each other and it's it's only the beauty of capitalism that keeps us from basically eating ourselves alive chapter called find win 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 solutions the metaphors that we use to think about society tend to be very binary, good versus evil, um, light versus darkness, win versus lose. And so they tend to think of business as a win-lose game. Somebody wins and somebody else is losing. But the beauty of capitalism is it's a win-win-win game. It's an infinite game. It's a game because the customers are winning or they wouldn't trade. The employees are winning. How are the customers winning? They're getting products and services at a, at a and, and and there's competition to make those services and products better. Uh, the employees are winning because they have jobs and opportunities uh, to grow, benefits are paid, and they do that voluntarily. They're not forced to work for any particular company. They do it because they think it's in their best interest. Win for the employees. The suppliers who are trading with the business, they're winning as well, or they wouldn't make the exchanges. Investors are winning, or they wouldn't make the investments. And the larger society is winning because business is the engine that creates all the money that goes into nonprofits and governments. Without business, there is no government and there is no, and there is no uh, nonprofit sector because those are ultimately supplied through what business creates. So business is a win-win-win game. All of these stakeholders are winning, and that's why capitalism lifts society up. Socialism is an attempt to reverse that back to a win-lose game. And that's why it always fails. And that's why capitalism How is it an attempt wins. to bring it back to a win-lose game? In what way? It, 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 the, the ones that are winning, so to speak, the business people are clamped down, so they're not allowed to win. It's like, we're going to take your success and we're going to redistribute it. So that, as again, you said earlier on, incentives matter. You know, the best thing about this guy is that he learns all the arguments of his opponents first. He, he, he was keen to make sure that he knew everything about socialism. He's read all of the socialist literature, as he said before. And that way, that's how he knows that he's making the best possible argument against this. So he's definitely identified every, every weakness. But we're, we're going to take away the incentives for business to really flourish and succeed. They should do it from altruistic reasons. And we may do some things for altruistic reasons, but you cannot build a society around it. Do you, when you're talking about win, 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 this is a very, in many ways, it's, I, I see what you're saying, but there are things that are negative that are associated with profit and innovation and particularly expanding industry, right? For particularly environmental impacts. Like when you talk, when you say win, 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 like there's, there's very, rarely when you're especially when you're dealing with creating and designing and building things you've got a negative impact in some way environmentally two two points um first of all historically socialism has been far worse worse polluter than in capitalist How so? countries well <laughs> just look at the environmental destruction that the soviet union left behind it, it was a complete disaster right but that's this, this is socialism done wrong john we're gonna do it right also what are you referencing are you, are you like, what is it oil extraction no the u.s the u.s like topples that the u.s <laughs> destroys the ussr and co2 emissions is it oh is it the nuclear fallout is that it okay all right well he saw he saw the hbo show and then he was like well yeah no that, that conclusively proves my point I, I, i'm sure everyone knows this Here. who has done it right joe <laughs> no, no, one. no one's done it no right one. but and the soviet he, union is a bad example no all stalin of, was yeah but all of eastern europe were there, there's no incentive to protect the common good mm. in socialism, and they don't. When the government has a monopoly of all decision and power making, they don't tend to look out for the environment. That's one of the myths. You also take uh, away agency from people, and you, you take away their desire to improve and do better. And socialism is when without the government incentive, does stuff. people just don't perform the same way. 
But the beautiful thing about business, let's concede a partial truth to what you said, that there will be unintended negative consequences, as you say, environmentally. Well, that's why you have to regulate business to a certain extent. That's why you have to make people responsible for their environmental pollutants. And because business innovates and has an incentive to innovate, um, business can innovate and create solutions to those environmental problems. Okay, let me stop you there for a second. When you say make people responsible for their environmental I gotta, I got to give it to Joe for once. At least he's pushing back against all this. He's not just sitting there and being like, oh, okay, yeah. Well, interesting. I, I did not know that. Yeah, okay, so socialism destroys the environment, but capitalism saves the environment. Well, that's, yeah, that's, that's, that's all right. That's what I'm going to say for now on. Then we're, we're going to have to deal with another aspect of capitalism, and that's the, the effect that special interest groups and lobbyists have on politicians because they create laws that shield these big businesses from consequences from these negative actions. So by saying that they have to clean up their problem, the only way that's ever going to happen is if they're not protected, if they don't use that influence and money. Totally agree. So this is where I think a lot of people have a, a valid argument against capitalism. The that, capitalism has kind of fucked over our, 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 our system of government in a way because money has gotten so deeply involved with super PACs and lobbyists and there's so much money involved that it changes the way we we govern things is that a flaw of capitalism or is that a flaw of government oh. i think it's a flaw of government but that government has been influenced by capitalism it's, by capitalism's desire for universal growth the, for constant growth the <clears throat> the sad truth is that humanity is not perfectible we can never create the perfect system and the attempt to create the perfect system that's no, no one is asking for that. We're just asking that some people have more equitable lives and that we start working towards the, a better future. That, that 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 answer is pretty much like, well, I got mine. I got mine, so I'm good. I'm good. And human beings, you're flawed, greedy monsters. But I got mine, so luckily I, I had some advantages and I got, I got to win. I got to win at the game. So now I'm gonna go off. You know what's really insidious about all of this and, and horrifying, really, is this mentality is what's permeating the richest people right now. I mean, you have to justify your existence in any way, shape, or form. And if you got the majority of the people, the workers, who are telling you at the end of the day, well, hey, this is uh, this is not equitable. This is a fucked up way to live. We don't want this anymore. You've got to tell yourself, well, I, 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 I'm actually doing the right thing because again it's the smart people the smart ones uh, who do good in university who get to the degrees who become ceos like myself and then we run the world but then we we help the world because we give you all jobs so so you're welcome and again uh, benevolent benevolent looking down upon ye uh, i have to justify it the same justifications that have been used throughout history to to justify all kinds of atrocities that's that's the whole reason we have the white race by the way it was the invention of the idea of races by the white race to a to be able to say well slavery is not that bad it's actually necessary because we need to subjugate other races because we actually have a genetic superiority. Uh, that's that's one of the reasons why we, we should be able to do this. So so yeah, race is a, is a real thing now. It's it's real, and the white race is the best race, and then uh, the other races should be subjected by the white race. But again, benevolent. It's for your own good. It's for your own good. Don't don't think too much about it. We're, we're doing this for you, for you at the end of the day. Because slavery as a system, in essence, is is basically exploiting someone's labor to the extremes. Uh, to the absolute extremes, uh, and also doing horrifying actions upon that, treating people like subhuman. And it's it, it's absolutely horrifying, but at the same time, there are still some overheads, right? Uh, if you are the slave master, for example, you still have to buy maybe some housing or have some some environment for them to live in. You have to give them some food. So those are, those are the bare minimum costs that you're doing. And if you're a feudal lord, uh, a lord who's looking down upon his serfs, then yes, you will have some minimal costs, such as you have to house them, you have to provide them with areas to live in, an area so that they can toil your field. You have to provide them with some protection, uh, say if other people are going to approach the castle or whatever have you. But again, there are some, there are some overhead costs, but then the rest of it, you get all the labor. Uh, sorry, all the extracted labor value from from those uh, from those peasants. Right. Capitalism is not perfect. It does not because oh, we've watched it choices already, and what people want. Yeah, he gets served. People to, uh, capitalism will sell cigarettes to people because that's what people want. It gives them pleasure, but it's bad for their health. But they're 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 giving people what they want. It's it's the same thing in in any type of externality. That's not. That's not deliberately done to harm the society. It's sort of a byproduct. Right, but this is why win-win-win doesn't really work. 
it's not really win 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 it's win most of the time but with some negative consequences that are better than the alternative right but what you strive for is to is to take those externalities or those negative consequences and try to through good government to to minimize them or lessen them i'll give you an example so you used to live in la well when i went to la back in the early 80s it was like going to new delhi today I couldn't see my lungs hurt less than 24 hours. Right. But through good regulations, the air in LA is a fraction as polluted as it was 40 years ago. You We've been able to capitalism? clean it up. That is an example of how you can take the worst impacts of industrialization and, and ameliorate them or lessen them. Episodes of the Joe Rogan Experience are now. Whoa, what? Whole Foods CEO said in 2005, it is illegal in the United States for there to be company unions, special unions, which are formed and controlled by the employees and managers of the company um, to represent their interests and collectively bargain on the behalf. Well, yeah, of course. If anyone doesn't know, by the way, the idea or what exactly is socialism? Socialism is worker controlled uh, owns of the means of production. So basically the workers who have the rights and ownership over their own businesses and as well, if you want to take things one step further, the ability to distribute those goods as well. So that's why on the micro level, forming worker cooperatives to me is a much better way going forward, a path forward, if you will, to work within the capitalist system. It's not the abolishment of capitalism, but it is giving worker rights that they don't have otherwise. So you will have the right to extend democracy into the workplace which is very, very important, right? The same democracy that you have, the ability to vote for your leaders, for your governors, for your, your presidents, whatever, you would have that in the workplace to be able to vote against the CEO who's making an inordinate amount of money and could be fucking you over because he's some weird IQ monster, like uh, whatever that was. So you would have the ability to vote them out. You would have the ability to change them. You'd have the ability to limit their pay. You'd have the ability to ask for more rights. You'd have the ability to vote for better health care for you and your fellow employees, all that kind of stuff, incredibly important. That, that, to me, is one of the reasons why they don't want that. And of course they don't, because it doesn't allow them to funnel all this incredible and vast amounts of wealth into their pockets. It, it wouldn't. You would then be able to share, again, the profits amongst the employees themselves, amongst the people, the workers who are working on the same thing. So that's, that's the whole reason they hate it. And one reason, by the way, why I point out that the, the USSR or China, for example, are not communist and they're not even socialist. Uh, those are state run capitalist endeavors. So there is more state control, but that state control is still funneled within the hands of the very few. In the case of China, as I was pointing out yesterday, the 90 million members who make up the Chinese Communist Party, that's a fraction of the percent of the entire country. That's 8% of the entire country. Of those 90 million members, 70% of them are men. And of those 90 million members, only about 3,000 are allowed to actually stamp and verify what uh, goes through parliament. And on top of that, uh, the Politburo, I believe, is made up of under 100 individuals. They're the ones who actually get to do the back channel bargains and dealings of the party and then ultimately the uh the control of the party rests within the hands of the general assembly manager the supreme leader as well as the leader of the general military xi jinping so that's not as if you have equitable control amongst all the workers that's that's not an example of that the same thing under ussr and stalin it, it was not a, a you know equitable control amongst the workers there was not an actual socialism being done there there was a bigger redistribution of wealth and trust me i'm not saying the american model is any better the american model basically puts the hands and control into corporations. The corporations are small little dictatorships of which none of us have any control. Not even the U.S. government. You see how many times the U.S. government tries to pull these people into meetings and boardrooms with all the, the pictures and the flashes and they're talking to them and they're like, hey, by the way, why did you do this bad thing? Why are you polluting everybody? Why are you killing us all? And they're like, uh, there was no other way because money gets me off. And then you're like, well, fuck, how, how do we stop this? How we can control you? Let's just find them a couple, couple mil or something like that and just happens and happens and happens. That's not a better system either. But again, why does that happen? Because there's dictatorships in these corporations. These same corporations that we always talk about, how they control the world and they control everything. Well, that's a, that's a half truth. But guess how you stop that? If the corporations were no longer dictatorships, if there was no longer a board, if there was no longer a CEO that controlled everything from top on down, then yes, you would have more democracy. We would have a more socialist working environment. And yes, we would have way less problems as a result of it. People would have rights again. We'd stop, being, we'd stop being in this unjust hierarchy. And this unjust hierarchy does allow for some upward mobility. People can move within it. It's, it's got more upward mobility than feudalism, but that is such a low bar. Like, who the fuck wants that? It's like, yeah, this is better than feudalism. Okay, this is better than slavery. Sure. Can we not have something that's better than capitalism? Can we, can we not evolve that too? Because we've been doing this for a long time, and it's not really working out for a lot of people. It's working out for a very small amount of people. So why not, why not just make things better? 
And that was my TED Talk, everybody. Hey, we want to mutual aid you to get some eyeballs on your work. So if you have a leftist YouTube channel or Twitch stream or something you want us to advertise, just send us a 20 to 30 second ad using the forms at wearesurfs.com. We'll do our best to help you out. And please submit once per channel. We're gods, I'm Rad, and Xander Forbes. We shall build temples in your honor. To our monarch, Tom Spiker, we live to do your bidding. To our lords, Jeffrey Lamb, Trevor R., Stephen, Nine Tails Cosmic Box, Aunt Josephine, Poppy Nelson, Ryan Lubin, Jimothy K. Meeble Beeps Jr., we bow meekly for your pleasure. And to our knights of the round table, Josh Mickelson, Dylan Bife, Zach Christensen, Todd Buckingham, Todd Lajeunesse, Political Puppy, Ali Menthol, Jimmy Big Nuts, Andreas Chitoro, Good Poon Hits Cops, That Solid Boom Then, Dr. Zayas, Joppy, Violent Orchard, Sophie Baby, Jack Darko, Thomas Barrington, Jay Fraser Cartwright, Goofalankius, Melissa Murphy, Nicholas Marks, Alexander Thaler, Ramon Acosta, and Ali Retta Jaffer. We salute you. Love you all. Peace.